And hi everyone, welcome to Life Edge. Because life just doesn't have to be mediocre. I am joined today by my good friend and co-host, Dr. Susan Nash. Susan, how are you today? Oh, great. We have a very interesting guest today who will talk to us about smart pipe and potentially space exploration. Yeah, I'm really interested in the smart pipe idea. That's that's pretty cool. And also, our our guest today, he's young. He's very young. And you know what? That just gives me hope. <laughs> just gives me hope for the future. Uh, you know, th there are some very smart young people today, and everybody, you know, blames them for everything. Nah, there's some damn smart people today. I'm, I'm, that makes me glad. Anyway, we also have with us Harold Mugliotti. He is on the video switcher and mixer, and here we go. This show is sponsored by Relay Corporation. Digital learning development, media development, corporate video, management consulting, and more. Visit us at www.relate.com. Thanks. And we are back, and Susan, would you like to do the honors? Yes, I'm so happy to introduce Deepak Altiam from TriDynamics. And I'm so excited that, that you're here. I, I first met your colleague and, and um, I guess, co-founder potentially, Alex That's Finch, right. who was at, at our event in, in Denver last year. We had a, 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 uh, an event called You Pitch, in which people presented new technologies. And I was so impressed with everything that, that you guys are doing. And then when I found out about the smart pipe, I just really wanted to know more. So just, um, just to get started, tell us a little bit about how you got started in technology. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me on the show. Really appreciate it. I uh, appreciate the time. Uh, so I'm the co-founder and CEO of Trid Dynamics. Uh, we're an early stage tech startup that's focused on making smart pipes for the upstream oil and gas market. Uh, we have known each other, my co-founders and I, Alex Finch and Jesse Lang have known each other for quite some time. We all met in our undergraduate days uh, at UC San Diego. I started a couple rocket clubs over there, and one of them we were tasked, uh, given a grant by NASA to 3D print one of the first rocket engines from university in the world. <laughs> and we were successful in making one of the biggest 3D print rocket engines in the world at the time and uh, tested that, and we actually launched that as well. So uh, we started a lot of our um, technology development efforts uh, with funding uh, through NASA, and some of my internships that I used to have uh, in my aerospace days. It sounds like you have no fun, just no fun at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I read all about that. I world. read about that NASA competition. When you mentioned, I was going. I remember that. Um, That's pretty cool. So, how big was the engine you guys created? It was about nine inches tall. It's pretty small engine, uh, but we so it's like a prototype. It, it was like a prototype engine, right? Yeah. Exactly. That's still pretty cool. We built out this really cool material called cobalt chromium. It's actually used for dental implants. Oh, interesting. And uh, we were pushing <laughs> the boundaries of what metal 3D printing could do at the time. They really couldn't get to bigger build volume. So we were telling the manufacturers to go bigger and to change up the materials and to really understand what the scope is for aerospace manufacturing products. And they really changed a lot of the recommendations uh, when we were pushing on this, what these products can look like. That's kind of neat. Hey, by any chance, was that a company called Argon in San Diego? It was not. It was no. not. The only reason I ask is they're like the world's largest amalgam company. They make all the crown materials no, and really. they're, they're pretty huge. And they're just off that eight, what is it? 805 a freeway, I think. Something exactly. like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. Uh, but that's still I pretty. That, yeah. yeah. It's so interesting too. I think just the, the fact that, that you're doing 3D printing and then moving from that to exploring the boundaries of what, what else you can do is, is fascinating. And what I think is interesting, too, is like, okay, so now you're embedding sensors. Or, or like, are you embedding sensors, or is the material itself um, used for, I mean, are you, how do the sensors work in, in the smart pipe and the 3D? So I can uh, give you a little background on what the smart pipe does and the applications that we see in the oil and gas industry. 
Um, we heard it was very, very difficult to obtain data in harsh environments. Um, and what we've also heard is that there, there are no real digital communications to anything down hole. From us coming from aerospace, it's pretty unheard of to not have anything outfitted with sensors. We don't fly without data. We don't send anything to space without data. We don't bring it into the air. We don't throw it in the air without data. We make sure everything's outfitted with sensors. We realized that it was really, really a challenge to get power and communication down home. We started to take a deeper dive to understand why. We realized that the environmental conditions that these sensors and power conduits are placed in are just not friendly or, or uh, inviting environments for electronics. And us coming from aerospace, we actually uh, were trying to use this technology as a method to mass produce rocket engine chambers. Mm. So it's a very, very durable technology that we were taking from the aerospace industry, and we found new life in the oil and gas market. So our process is called the cold metal fusion process. We can spray metal powder at very, very high speeds. And while doing so, we can actually uh, bond metal together without any type of binder. And it gives us a lot of flexibility in what we can do, basically. Um, by allowing us to spray metal powder at very high speeds, we never need to melt the metal. And so the reason why I'm talking about this is because if I never need to melt the metal, I can actually build at relatively low temperatures, which allow, it, allow us to safely embed electronics and create hermetic seals uh, to the electronics we work in. So our cold metal fusion process works in open air. We have a very, very large build chamber, build volume that we can work within in very low process temperatures. We get low oxides and very low heat related warping. So all of this is really talking about us having the ability to build electronics into metal structures without damaging the underlying electronics. So we started getting the ideas, if we can build electronic sensors and electrical subsystems into metal structures, what are the fundamental building blocks of an oil and gas well? Every oil and gas well has uh, a section where they have to drill out and bore out the well. Then they have to install pipes and then they have to cement it. And then after is the perforation and production. But the basic infrastructure that's in every single well is a metal pipe. What if we had the ability to integrate all of these electrical subsystems into the thickness of the pipe wall itself? the base building block that every single well has, what if I can build electrical subsystems and make each of these pipes smart? And that's sort of where our smart technology comes from. The ability to embed electrical subsystems and commercial off-the-shelf uh, electrical systems uh, right into the thickness of the pipe itself. What are you conducting with? Is it nanotubes or something else? Uh, we can work with virtually any type of commercial cable. Our goal cable. isn't to reinvent the type of conduit. Yeah. Uh, we can work with coax cable. We can work with fiber optics also. Nice. Um, we haven't found the easiest ability to transfer data through couplings with fibers. So um, all of our pipes are, they look the same as a normal, uh, a normal casing basically. So you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a normal casing and our smart casing and they come unassembled just the same way as you normally install it. And so the reason why I'm saying that is because if we were able to install fiber into the outside diameter of it, it'd be hard to install one continuous fiber in doing so. So we want to make sure there's a little breaks possible for using fiber optics. But our, our underlying ability has the opportunity to embed virtually any type of electrical subsystem into the surface of a metal structure. <laughs> nice. That's pretty good. So, yeah, I've so, been using fiber optics. Oh, sorry. No, no go ahead. They've been using... And they've been using fiber optics for a while down down hole, and then obviously there are all kinds of sensors while drilling, uh, so there's logging while drilling, but then the the fiber optics are expensive. So this sounds like it's potentially much less expensive. Exactly, where we understand that cost is a constraint, uh, especially in this economy with the drivers of a, a low price of a barrel of oil. We need to bring down the break-even price for all of the operators out there and all the companies working in, in production and completions. And to, br to bring that break-even price down, we need to increase the estimated ultimate recovery. How do we increase the amount of production that each of these wells have? Right now, it's hard to even tell if a cluster is being perforated or being uh, fractured efficiently, which is a crazy thought for us. And when we're coming from aerospace, the fact that we don't have sensors down hole and we don't know if the fluid is traveling in each of these clusters at the same rate or the same amount. That's why we have frac hits. That's why we have inefficient operations. 
um, we, we, we have stock standard cookie cutter well designs and we can't create custom designs on the fly for different types of regional formations. And so we're really trying to understand this data in real time to give the operators all of the insight and all the power to make great decisions. Because right now, it's very, very difficult to make real-time decisions. And because those real-time decisions aren't made, we have very inefficient operations. That's fascinating. And I think um, some of the other applications that you had that or it could be used for essentially minimizing the amount of, of frac fluid and also minimizing the amount of, uh, of um, oil fields chemicals is really exciting too. Absolutely. So I, I just want to start off by saying uh, we aren't uh, specifically competing with the fiber. We're trying to bring the value of what a fiber can bring in a very different uh, communication structure and a different electrical structure. So the, the value of fiber brings is real-time communication for acoustic, temperature data, and maybe stress and strain. We can incorporate acoustic sensors, we can incorporate thermocouples or thin film sensors or other MEMS-based sensors into a very small form factor that fit into the thickness of a pipe. So what a fiber can do, we can do as well, but we can also incorporate power distribution downfall. So the entire industry works basically in analog. We're trying to move from analog to digital, from 1G to 5G. And this entire industry right now, the upstream market, doesn't work with uh, high bandwidth communication. We need to increase the communication frequency so that the operators know what types of data are being obtained so they can make better decisions in terms of being able to fracture at a higher pressure or a lower pressure if a cluster is doing properly in the first place. And you're exactly right, uh, Susan. We don't know how much where the fluids are going right now. So right now we can have uh, our fracture fluids going to uh, the last set of perforations in the cluster, and not even the first 90%, which is some of the leading basis for why we have frac hits. We don't know where fracture fluids go. So the types of uh, uh, applications that we can see in fiber we can utilize those types of values within our own uh, our own smart pipes, which we're naming bike pipe. Uh, but we can also start incorporating electricity downfall. And this is the whole advent of, it brings in the advent of automated drilling, automated production, automated completions. So we really want to try and incorporate the digital infrastructure, the telephone lines, the power lines of the upstream oil and gas market. Well, and we, I have noticed that there are about five or six different companies that I know of that are trying to do driverless geosteering. So they do have, um, there, there are power sources and the, and the horizontal wells are quite long, but as you mentioned, sometimes they're just kind of pushing the limits of an existing technology instead of switching over to a new one. Exactly. We've tried to innovate on mud poles for decades now, but we've only tried to innovate with mud poles because we haven't been able to establish a proper data and power conduit with digital signals. And what we really want to do is bring the upstream oil and gas market to the digital age and allow that power and data conduit to be uh, a low cost implementation to our operators uh, form factors and our operators products. And the other thing, too, is you might be able to do later, like targeted in situ stimulation, like adsorption or whatever in the um, in gas well, so that you could actually increase by stimulating like electrically instead of having to do it like through electrical charges through, through like NACL or something. Yeah. Just, I mean, just imagine if we're going through a, a re-stimulation phase and we had valves that were down hole that we can actuate digitally where I wanted to selectively stimulate one or a few stages where I can use these valves, or I can just, I, I can bypass the other stages and I can selectively stimulate one or 10 stages uh, in series. It just allows our operational in, uh, in, uh, efficiencies to increase exponentially. Because we're doing everything manually right now. And not to say that the people that are doing the work are doing a bad job, not at all. They're doing a fantastic job and they're doing the best job they can. And it's pretty amazing that we're able to be so efficient with the operations 
with our given infrastructure, but we're innovating using inefficient operations. We need to innovate with the most efficient form of communication and the most efficient form of power transmission. And that's what we're trying to implement into the oil and gas market. How's the market uh, reacting to this? Because it sounds pretty exciting. I, we're relatively new into the industry. Uh, when the downturn has started to happen, we assumed that a lot of people would basically tell us to shoo away and it's the wrong time, we have other things to deal with. Uh, this, this isn't what we're looking for. Surprisingly, we've had, uh, I'd say 90 to 95% of our conversation have, have said, we, yes, we need this. Where is this? Uh, do you have a brochure? Can I buy this? How much does it cost? We're, at a, we're a very early stage company. We have prototypes of building our products. Yeah. We've shown the validation on the bench scale, and right now we're just looking for the right strategic partners to help take it to the next level. No, oh, that's great. But we have the engineering team ready, and the really good market market uh, responses so far. And, and actually, smart yes. investors and right. in smart companies usually, when there is a downturn, that's the best time to invest. That's the best time to up exactly. up the technology because they're not doing anything else for a little bit. You know, it, it's funny. A lot right. of companies think, "Oh, we're dying right now. What are we going to do? We're going to die." No. Think differently, and and so that's probably why you're getting such a good response. Because, what better time to to get ready for the future that when things are going down, when they come back up, you're well, ready. Exactly, and I think too that that people have a little bit more time that they're and they're willing to to learn. So, for example, um, I was got involved with a two day machine learning, basically random forest using mm -hmm. Excel rather than, and Visual Basic rather than, than Python. And it, it sold out. I mean, and I thought, wow, that's just kind of amazing. But then in the background, I mean, everybody keeps saying the same thing, that, that this is a time to up your skills. And the other thing, too, I'm hearing, and I don't know what you think about this, Deepak, but people are saying, okay, Communication is fantastic. It's great that we have global communication. We have access to apps, etc. But we really need security that's local, in terms of supply chain, in terms of, of tools and technology, and, it, and it's just painfully clear and apparent is in, in many different countries. Uh, completely. So it seems like um, yours, yours and having a domestic local. supply chain that's going to be there and reliable for our infrastructure, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to invest domestically. We need to invest in new technologies and ideas that are going to be game changing. We've seen a, a big reluctance with a lot of these larger um, industries that have a, uh, a hereditary footstep or um, just a, a corporate structure heritage. Um, the lack of innovation sometimes with trying to push absolutely game changing technologies uh, there's obviously going to be a portion of budget that needs to go to it. It's not going to be 100% of it, and that's not what I'm advocating for. But we love to see innovation. I mean, we when we were in the aerospace industry, we were the first student group to 3D print a rocket engine. Nobody believed we can do it at the time. Everyone actually said, uh, don't worry if it blows up. It's okay. You guys are doing a great job just getting this far. And we're like, yeah, if it does, it does. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But the first test went successfully. And we said, you know, it doesn't really matter if somebody believes if it will happen or won't. If we believe in what we can do, then we'll make it happen no matter what. This is the same team that did that. I built that rocket engine. And we led that team to be successful launching it. And now we're trying to work into a brand new industry to us with a lot of similar parallels. But a lot of this corporate heritage struggle in trying to adopt new technologies and implement it, I'll tell you, the first few people that actually implement this infrastructure are going to be the ones that stay in that are going to be the ones that stay uh, efficient in operations and stay alive for the long term. <coughs> and people that are really doing well. Well, you know, most of the problems in technology aren't operational; they're behavioral, more than anything else. Because and, and engineers are famous for the doctors, engineers. It's real common. They're very stubborn about what they know, and they rarely want to know more. And that's one of the problems with a lot of engineers. And so as a result, as new technologies come about, they kind of, yeah, yeah, I don't need it. I don't care about that. And that's foolish because that is what makes your companies grow. It makes you stay future-proof, if you will. There's a lot of old technology. You know, the U.S. is suffering from old technology everywhere. You know, we're very technologically advanced, but we're pretty far behind operationally to other countries because they started way after we did 
with newer things. And we're getting there in some areas, but we're not there in every area. You know, power generation, you know, not all the companies in the U.S. are very advanced. Southern California Edison, I know because we did a lot of work with them in the past, they were on the leading edge of the new technology that was digital, communicating digitally with all the substations, making sure everything was on the grid, working around problems on the grid. Nobody was doing that. And now they're starting to get there around the whole country, and it's been about 20 years since, since those projects happened. So you could tell things move slowly, but when they move, those who moved are gonna be so much further ahead of the curve. And uh, and so that's so what you're and saying is perfectly right. You've got to be, right. yeah. It's gonna be it's exciting actually, yeah, to see what you guys are doing and and how it can change an industry and like you said, make it more effective. Imagine that, right? Yeah, exactly. That, that's what we're hoping for. Uh, we really want to make a transformational change in anything we do. We want to want to work on building technologies that make a difference and a, a significant impact in the products that we build for the for these industries. Um, being able to move from analog to digital uh, mm -hmm. is something that we really believe is going to be a transformational step in what this industry can do and what it can be pushed towards in the future. For uh, you're right, this is behavioral change. Uh, we've mm -hmm. actually, like I said before, we've been getting very, very good reception on what we're doing. Um, we're just excited about where it's going to go, and we've only uh, entered into the upstream oil and gas space for a little over a year, year and a half now, mm -hmm. and it's been great. Um, like I said, we came from aerospace, and aerospace, things are slow. We left because of the red tape. Mm. We, uh, expensive lawyers, uh, couldn't hire non-U.S. citizens, um, a lot of other things in addition to us not being able to grow fast as a young company, uh, led us and pushed us away from moving into a different industry. And the oil and gas industry does love new technology. Um, we're really excited to find the right partners that want to adopt this and implement it and be the next game changers. That sounds well, great. One thing that I'm thinking too that you're you're talking about horizontal wells, but right now some of the large discoveries, a lot of excitement, is in uh, deep water offshore, hmm. and so of course ExxonMobil and in Guyana is really developing that. But then Equinor has a new discovery in the Gulf of Mexico, and one of the challenges in deep water has been just. A, there are a lot of monitors, but once you get into the reservoir, it's very difficult. So can you envision your technology working offshore? Absolutely. Um, we'd love to actually take you through one of my slides just to give you an uh, idea yeah. of what that means. <clears throat> uh, let's take you through um, slide, let's say, six. If you can bring that up, that'd be perfect. Uh, so. What we're doing is we want to bring forward a casing that looks and feels like a normal casing would. Uh, we would take it from a manufacturer, we would augment with our process and deliver it right to uh, the end user. And the end user right now that we're looking at are upstream uh, onshore markets, but our technology can be applied to a wide variety of applications. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, please. And the real advantage that we're bringing to the industry is our electroflow connectors. We don't come with this corporate heritage. We had no idea how people designed pipes or that pipes were uh, even a big deal before. Um, but what we did was we actually innovated around what we saw were some of the uh, fixed components of a pipe, the design of the threads, if it's doped or dopeless and the spacing of them. And we actually created our own connector that bypasses all of these threaded designs with a hermetic seal, but creates a hardwired connection between our smart pipes and the next smart pipe and the next smart casing that's put together. And the reason why I bring that up is because uh, this initial um, innovation that we made can be applied both onshore and offshore. Um, we also have the ability to build our electrical subsystems into the coupling or into the, the actual infrastructure of the pipe itself. Uh, we've had some customers come to us and ask us if we can incorporate strain gauges into the wall fix of the pipe uh, or incorporate uh, thermocouples for temperature measurement. All of this would help them in real time be able to drill better and be able to perforate and be able to complete their wells better. So if you go to the next slide, uh, it really talks about sort of what the differences in value that we can provide uh, offshore and onshore with our own uh, smart casing versus the value propositions of fiber optics. 
we're not really a competitor of fiber. Um, we really are in competition with what the value is and for what cost we can bring that to our customers for. Uh, we have a quasi uh, distributed uh, sensing package. So if any one of these sensors break uh, or go bad, we can still power and communicate with everything in parallel. And this is key. Uh, people love the idea of using fiber but it's the idea that they love. Implementation is hard. <laughs> uh, implementation is extremely difficult to work with fiber optics. Uh, it's a, a pain in the butt. They have to strap a physical fiber to the outside of a pipe and run this down in a, in a jagged well with abrasive edges hmm. uh, and very high stress environments where we can just build it into the pipe itself so it's a seamless solution. Offshore, the biggest problems are really trying to get data in real time so that they can make the decision to either uh, drill deeper or to understand how their formations are forming, what the temperature differences in their formations, to know where their actual reservoirs or where their where their uh, deposits are, and they don't get this. Uh, they don't get this information right now. And these are hundreds of millions of dollars that were put into building these wells, but all of the information they get right now is all based off of logged data. So mm -hmm. data from gauges that they send down and they read it after the fact. They never read it in real time. Just think about this. If you are going through this process, you're drilling down miles into the earth and you have millions of dollars a day in operational use, you can't get this data until you pull up the gauges, until you read that the data from, from the logs and then go down and try and implement a decision. It's just crazy to think about that. And we need to get this information in real time to the operators. But offshore has a lot well, of applications. I mean, that's potentially not completely true because they do have logging while drilling and they do there are downhole sensors. But as you point out, they tend to be fiber and they're not, and, and they're quite expensive. And yours is, it looks a lot less expensive. The, here's a devil's advocate question. So, so how about, um, Corrosion. I, I was looking at at the. It seems like there are a lot of opportunities for corrosion there. Have Have you addressed that in yeah, the test? That's tests? a really good question. So, the underlying process has been designed for actually creating corrosion resistant coatings in our Department of Defense. This is not a completely brand new manufacturing process, but we're finding a new life with our product in this industry. So we can create corrosion resistant coatings uh, and we can also bond with the same material as the casing structure or the same material as the tubular goods that we're developing and building with. So we won't necessarily see the galvanic corrosion if we work with the same materials. Um, we can also create the corrosion resistant coatings on top of uh, the embedment that we've worked with them too. So it's a great question. A lot of people have asked, uh, what, what type of uh, aspects of galvanic corrosion are there? Um, what do oxides look like? Um, and this is actually a very, very low, uh, uh, it, it develops very low oxidation coatings. And the reason why is when we actually impact the surface of um, the substrate or material with the metal particles, it breaks the oxide layer upon impact. Hmm. So most other um, energy deposition technologies melt the material in a uh, medium, let's say an inert gas, or let's say it's air, when upon impact, upon cooling, it takes the oxygen from the outside environment and causes corrosion due to the outside environment, the oxidation that occurs. Our inherent process never actually uh, inhibits or induces the sets of oxidation that are really built up layer by layer in our process. So we have some fundamental advantages to how we can build up very thin layers and structural coatings as well. Oh, that's great. Yeah, um, the, the one thing I actually want to go back, you're right, there are other people that can do uh, logging while drilling. There aren't many people that do it though. It's really expensive. The biggest problem is how do you manufacture these products in such a large scale such that the economies of scale are brought down? Now, this is why we were actually looking at building, using this technology for rocketage, because we we envision the future of aerospace um, where we need thousands of rocket engines to build a year to our future space travel back and forth, just like we have taxis and like we have airplanes. Moving over to the oil and gas industry, we have thousands of miles of pipes built a year.
that are being put into put into wells. Our underlying technology as an additive technology is not developed for high complexity, low volume. It's actually developed for low complexity, high volume. And so it gives us some advantages as well on that end where we can actually bring it, bring down the cost in economies of scale better with higher volumes. Um, uh, Sure. You don't have to answer if you don't want to. <laughs> so, okay, so when you were in SpaceX, you were talking, you were like in rockets, and SpaceX has, has, has our, our, um, satellites, and they're used to monitor um, conditions yeah. and gather information. So, that's from above. But can we somehow spy on countries from the, the, the ocean below? That's an interesting like, question. I haven't I haven't thought about that to be honest. So uh, it's, uh, it's I, I I'll think about it and get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't really thought about it before this one either. <laughs> <laughs> We've implemented a lot of seismic networks underground. So whatever yeah. that could be for uh, for our data transmission and, and how people can use it is interesting. <laughs> Well, you think about it. I mean, there's so much that you can detect, and if you just as a matter of filtering it and 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 um, analyzing it, and we have the ability now, with, you know, neural networks and deep learning mm -hmm. <laughs> to detect patterns. Oh, exactly. Um, I'm, it was it was really interesting when we started getting to this industry. We heard that a lot of the designs of different wells. Um, started to become standardized about six to eight years ago. And it started to become standardized because a lot of the people didn't necessarily know from well to well what was the difference or they needed to decrease costs so it isn't completely custom designs and solutions. You brought up the point of utilizing neural networks and big data. You're exactly right. The, now having the ability to get singular data points and individual data points that don't necessarily only, that aren't just regional, um, we can start incorporating more customized solutions in all of these designs and all of the new wells that we develop. And we know that the push for big data and AI is there. I know these are general terms that people bring out. I want to just bring this to focus because the ability to understand the formation depths and as well as the, um, the characteristics of each individual well is going to allow us to increase our EUR by order of magnitude. And this is what I'm excited about bringing to the table is being able to translate individual data points that are part of specified regions into what this whole uh, formation looks like for uh, overall design architectures for different well, wells that are put together. I really like that. So do you have more slides for us to look at? I do. Uh, we can Good. go on to the next one. So one of the biggest applications uh, that I want to talk about is what we're first doing with our bite pipe. The first sensor we're putting in our bite pipe is a temperature sensor. And what I wanted to explain is that our temperature sensor, by incorporating that, has a wide variety of applications with just one sensing capability. So we can incorporate leak detection, stimulation monitoring, understanding cluster efficiency. And one of the big ones that a lot of people have been talking about is really understanding what our cement curing looks like. In uh, most of these wells, without having great cement logs, we don't necessarily understand where the fractures go or if they're going to be done well, if the perforations are done well. We can create a circumferential log around the entire surface of the pipe and bring that throughout the entire lateral to know that if the top section is curing at a higher rate or even curing at all relative to the bottom section, we'll know we have problems over here. And we can incorporate all of this into the idea of using a bite pipe that has a quasi-distributed sensor uh, architecture. Um, one of the other advantages by utilizing quasi-distributed system, which basically means I build everything in parallel, it's not one continuous point, uh, is that I don't actually have to uh, do directional perforations. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people that know how to use fiber downhole would understand that perforations and going through the completion process is another pain in the butt because you have to either use directional perforations or pray and hope that you don't perforate your million dollar fiber that you're dropping down hole. Mm -hmm. The way that we can develop our systems because it's so low cost, 
we can create multiple conduction paths that even if perforated, allow for communication and power to be transmitted to the next coupling, to the next section. So our first pipe and our first sensor is gonna be a temperature sensor. The future pipes and future sensors that we work with uh, our applications are gonna be with pressure, strain, and other types of applications with power. So when I talk about power, I'm talking about what if I start incorporating a valve design that connects to our electro flow connectors that can be open and closed digitally and can be communicated. What if I start doing remote perforations? What if I start opening and closing sleeves remotely instead of having them be mechanical? We see, a, we see the ability for wireline-based technologies to be integrated into our packages. And we don't want to be the one that does all of it. We want other people, we want to work with other companies to integrate new designs for casing strings that they can work with our casings, uh, with different manufacturers that have different that have products that they want to work to power. We want to power your products as well. We don't want to always be the one that are developing all the products from the outright. We know you guys have great ideas. We're young. We want to work and try and get the technology out there. So if anyone out there has new designs of uh, valves, of different sensors, of different types of uh, uh, pipe string or tubular string goods that you want powered or communicated with, let's have a conversation so we can see how we can connect it in line with our own bike pipe. And uh, if we go to the next slide, it really gives you an idea of what stage we're at right now. So um, we are a, a pretty early stage company. Uh, we are working to find a strategic partner right now uh, and we're looking for people to join our alpha development initiative. We don't have uh, the largest availability, but we're looking for a few key partners. Uh, if we, yeah, if you guys can bring that, it'd be perfect. Um, the few key partners to work with us uh, to really understand some product feedback and to understand how we can develop this to really better meet your needs. Um, we've raised a million dollars so far uh, in venture funding. Uh, we are still trying to understand how to get more funding to develop our new product lines. Uh, but what we've done so far is we developed our cold metal fusion process. We've done this in copper and aluminum. We come from aerospace, so we use materials that are uh, lightweight and really good to work with in these high performance applications. We've done. We did a really good job at it. Coming to the oil and gas industry, we started realizing that a lot of people like to use higher carbon steels. So now we are redesigning our system to work with higher carbon steels. We have safely embedded a temperature sensor in aluminum and we verified that our electroflow connectors work in our bench scale test. And the next thing we're gonna be doing is working with our strategic partners to create a full scale prototype that we wanna test down hole and deliver beta, uh, deliver beta prototypes to, to test it in pilots as well. And so the next slide really just talks about our background, uh, who we are as our co-founders and who our advisors are and helped us out to get to where we are today. Uh, we've gotten some funding in the past from the National Science Foundation and through NASA grants. Uh, we are uh, entrepreneurs and residents at the Autodesk Technology Center. Um, we really work with a few different advisors in the industry right now that are giving us some key insights to understanding uh, what purchasing habits look like and what people really want in this industry. Um, my background, I work for a few different NASA centers. I also work at SpaceX. My co-founders have worked in the industry for quite some time as well. But we jumped into building this company as soon as we could. Uh, and we've been working uh, on this company for about five years now. Uh, so that's a little bit about our background, about who we are, and uh, we're going to be growing our team even during this downturn uh, to try and meet the needs of our customers. And we have a lot of customers. I'm excited, excited to see. I'm excited to see some of the people involved, like the unique ventures. That's uh, uh, they're they're cool. And then uh, through tubing solutions, they're in Oklahoma City. So that, they are. I know that. <laughs> we made a lot of really great connections through these uh, conferences that we've been going in, where my co-founder Alex met you as well, and uh, we, a lot of the uh, industry, industry the people we're meeting, they're just so kind. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to be over here. They want to give their time. They really want to help uh, young entrepreneurs like ourselves, and it's it, it's been it's oh, been yeah. so nice to be uh, an industry that really wants to give, and we've, we've had nothing but great experiences from it and been so happy that the community wants to give back and wants to see us succeed. And thank you for everyone else that's helped us get here so far. Oh, that's great. And we are just about out of time. Uh, Deepak, what's a good way for people to get a hold of you? A website or any other method? Yeah, if you go to the next slide, it tells you just that. Oh, there you go. Perfect. <laughs> you can contact me through email. Uh, you can look at our website as well. Uh, 
we are excited to have communications and talk to anyone that's uh, interested in learning more about our technology and learning more about the applications that we can bring to the uh, to the industry. Uh, we, we love having conversations with new people and people that have innovative ideas. We love thinking big, we love thinking new, and we want to be a game-changing force in this, uh, in this industry. Uh, so really appreciate your time and thanks for having me on. Oh, it's wonderful having you on. And uh, we'll have your information on the oh, notes below. You. So if you have any questions, you can click on links right below and that'll take you to Deepak's website. That was fun. It was it's actually very interesting, and, and I, I like the ideas you guys are coming up with. And it is also interesting to see how so much has come from space in the past and still continues to come from space because it's a harsh environment, and uh, it doesn't get much harsher than space in a lot of ways. So this is very interesting. Uh, we wish you the best of, of not luck, just success. With the best of success. You guys look like you're well entrenched and heading in the right direction so good good fortunes to you and uh, we'd love to have you thank back you on so in the much. future just to see where you're going that'd uh, be oh, absolutely yeah that'd be fun yeah no i, I really appreciate this um like i said before uh, there's so many people that are doing such an amazing job trying to help us out uh and being able to get the exposure to talk about what we're doing is great we haven't had this many people that have been excited and say, said if you can actually bring this industry, this would be a transformation that we haven't seen in decades. And mm -hmm. we love that energy and we love everything about it. So yep. we're hoping to do that. And bring this <clears throat> That's great. All right, great. And so if you enjoyed watching the show, please give us your feedback and you can leave comments below and we will send them off to Deepak. Anyway, have a good one, everyone. Thank you for sharing you. Deepak and Susan until next week. And we'll see you guys all next week too. Thanks, bye-bye. Appreciate it. Thank you, bye.